Hi, I'm, I'm uh, Corby Lewis. I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, hydraulic modeling and really what, what uh, consequence estimators need, need to know to, as far as the inputs, to, the kind of the base inputs before you start taking a look at, at, at consequences. It all comes from the water first. So kind of, kind of overview of the objectives here. We're going to talk about the important aspects of hydro, hydraulic modeling uh, in terms of depth velocity, arrival time. Um, specifically, we're going to talk about breach parameters, but really we're going to cover all the hydraulic modeling inputs and, and kind of give an overview of, of what goes into producing some, some hydraulics that actually are the first step in, in driving consequences. And it's sort of an outline of, of what we'll be talking about, the role of hydraulics and hydrology, uh, you know, the, really the basics of, of the modeling that we use and some of the, the base assumptions and common assumptions that are made, and talk about some of the sources of where those, where the, where those, uh, uh, in, where that information can come from, and a few resources we have available, um, you know, even before we get into modeling to, to, to take a look at uh, flood, flood risk, flood potential. Of course, there's a lot of assumptions that go into, into hydraulics and hydrology modeling, and we'll talk about some of the common ones that we use within the core, especially, uh, to produce these. <clears throat> And then, of course, there's always uncertainty, and you know, I'm, I'm sure you're talking about this on several of the modules this week. But really, you know, how do you consider uncertainty, and, and how are we applying model results? And we'll talk a little bit about that in context. Okay. So, for, first off, you know, before you begin consequence assessments, first of all, where does the water come from, right? Um, and, and there's really some critical critical driving forces for consequences. Who's gonna, who is actually going to get wet? Um, if they do get wet, how deep will it be? Um, when when will the water get there? Or is there time to react and, and, and maybe think about evacuation? Um, and once it gets there, is it going to rise really quickly, or is it going to kind of slowly rise where you can even react during during um, during the flood as, as the water's coming up. Um, and if it shows up, is it going to be kind of a backwater, shallow water flooding, or is there going to be velocity that, that's ripping through and, and causing consequences on its own? And then if you are evacuating, you're interested in whether the, the evacuation routes are, are going to be flooded. So all those things, sort of we can source that information and, and think about that um, before we get started with the consequence assessment. And that's, that's where the hydraulics comes from. This is a little uh, tongue-in-cheek here, but, um, you know, as far as the H&H &H discipline, you know, really no, no, no consequence happens without the, wa with, without the water. I guess until, until we do our H&H our &H work, <coughs> um, you really don't have any consequences. You, can, you just uh, dry land, sunny day, um, we're looking good. So it really takes the water to... to, to to drive consequences. Okay, so I'm going to cover some of just the very basics and principles of hydrologic and hydraulic modeling. I'll start with the hydrologic modeling. Hydrologic modeling is, is sort of a defined as really the response of of the uh, basin to applied, you know, weather or, or rainfall. Um, you know, to start with, you need some type of weather event. By and large, we're talking about rainfall. Of course, we can have we can have snow melt driven events, and we can have um, tidal events where there's a storm surge or maybe some wind driven wave action. But in general, in, in general, we're talking about a rainfall applied to a applied to a watershed, and uh, that rainfall then. You know, hit, hits the watershed and, and flows over land or through small tributaries, collects in, into the stream, and then the stream. You know, we we take a look at the open channel flow, take the stream, <clears throat> and, and model the water in the in the stream, and then we can start to look at how high the water would get once it's once it's in the in in the stream or channel, and then you have a you know kind of a depth estimate, and of course other parameters come with it. So we can decompose this into individual individual steps. 
weather runoff, um, then the flow in the channel, and then the actual response of flooding and elevations. Um, and so there have been so so far, far as the response of the of the watershed to rainfall, it you know we've been doing this um, for 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 many many decades. Um, Trying to trying to come up with methods for for understanding when water hits hits a basin, what's the response downstream, and kind of the 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 we have the water cycle, but the really the unit hydrograph um, theory is 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 the basis for most rainfall runoff model modeling, and that kind of as a definition is is for one inch of excess pre precipitation you would expect a certain type of flow at a downstream gauge for that basin. So what you can do is you can <clears throat> measure the measure the rainfall with a, either a series of, of network of rainfall gauges or or through now we use radar type methods, but still the the, the bottom line would be catching the base method is is catching catching uh, rainfall gauges across across the basin. And then you can go separately, measure the the stream flow that happens downstream, look at the shape of the hydrograph flow over time, um, and you can see different rain different basins will respond differently. I think this the uh, on the upper right here, these two figures kind of show maybe a catchment that that has a kind of a more of a uh, circular shape and one that has sort of a double uh, kind of a separate kind of a double shaped where you might because of that shape. Um, you might end up getting a kind of a double peak tidograph. Um, so each basin is unique, and and by trying to summarize that response based on rainfall is called the unit hydrograph theory, and that's really the the, the basis for for most hydrologic modeling. And even even today, um, of course, now we do have distributed rainfall uh, where we actually do gridded gridded rainfall and and actually take a look at even you know gridded gridded models that individual units of the catchment and and we can route water that way um, so there are there are more advanced methods that are continuing to gain gain kind of uh, um, use and, and popularity but the unit the unit unit uh, hydrograph theory is still incredibly valuable so the source of the source of uh, the weather um, so what what weather do we apply for for hydrologic modeling? You know, for, I, I kind of group a, a few different category, big picture categories. We have historical storms where you might have, uh, you know, measured rainfall uh, across uh, across a basin from a historical storm directly. So we we can model that. Um, we can do predicted storms. Maybe uh, you know the, the weather the the weather service puts out puts out forecasted rainfall uh, um, so we can uh, we can apply that to to a basin and see the response and that can be really valuable during real time events and we've also got a, a range of hypothetical storms there's a there's a, you know we've got a sometimes we do frequently frequency based hypothetical storms based on you know historical statistical um, analysis of, of rainfall gauges uh, of, of point rainfall but then separately we we have Hypothetical storms that have, um, you know, the probable maximum um, precipitation. Uh, we got studies of, of of that of that, with and then you apply certain shapes to the to the rainfall, and and time durations. And so there's a variety variety of methods. I don't think I'm doing any one of them justice here, but we these are the type of storms that are often of interest when we're when we're doing do, doing hydrologic modeling. And then we move that, you know, forward into the hydraulics and, and consequence estimate, depending on which scenario you're you're studying specifically. So, kind of shifting now to the hydraulics. So this is more we're talking about open channel flow. Um, there's kind of at a, at a base level, you know, there's there's equations to describe the the movement and interaction of fluid with with itself. You'll hear the the Navier-Stokes um, equations as a term and that's really a generalized um, fluid flow equation and then for for hydraulic modeling we simplify that down next one we talk about shallow water equations we drop some of the terms 
um, St. Bernard equations. And then the energy equation is probably what most engineers in, in, in the field are, are, are used to hearing. The energy equation, sometimes called the Bernoulli equation. But it's really, so that, what that is is basically just saying that energy is constant upstream to downstream minus any friction losses. So the elevation of water plus the velocity, the energy contained in the velocity or velocity head um, are, is equal between two different, two different cross sections along a stream, upstream to downstream. And really, the, the, the issue becomes trying to estimate what the friction losses are. Um, so the friction losses, you'll hear the Manning's equation. A lot of people are familiar with that Manning's n value. And that, that's sort of a, a, a roughness a parameter that helps us uh, you know, calculate what the friction losses would be uh, for a given velocity. So that is the, the, the bare bones of how we do open channel flow. Uh, modeling in, in, in one dimension. Yeah, that Manning's end highlight that. I think that's probably has the most, uh, you know, recognition among, among uh, practitioners in, in the field. Okay. So the state of the practice, certainly within the core, we, we use HEC RAS as our, as our primary tool that we use for hydraulic modeling. I kind of wanted to draw some, some big distinctions and define a couple of terms that you'll hear. One is the difference between steady flow modeling and unsteady flow modeling. Okay, excuse me. So steady flow versus unsteady flow modeling. Uh, steady flow, what that is, is just trying to understand the response and elevation that you would get given a, in the river given a certain flow. So you model a, a flow for an entire reach of river. You have a, a, a constant flow, and there's no time associated with it. So you're just applying that flow, and applying the, the energy equation, and figuring out, you know, estimating the, 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 the depth everywhere, the water surface elevation everywhere. There's no time component to it. So, of course, there, most of the questions we ask, certainly with consequence modeling, are, 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 have a, do have a time component. To it, uh, how how fast will the water arrive? When does the the flood wave get here? If if this happens, then what? Uh, there's always a time component to it, so that's where we need to start to use unsteady flow modeling, where you're actually, um, you know, get that full hydrograph. You're applying not a not a constant inflow on the upstream end. You're applying a time series of inflows on the upstream end, and and looking at the response not just in elevations but in time and elevations. Okay, so that's steady flow versus unsteady flow. Now another big one, uh, I think the state of the practice is, is, is moving a little bit towards two-dimensional modeling versus one-dimensional modeling. Um, so now we're looking at not only the time component, but we're looking at the, the you know, water not just being able to flow in a downstream direction, but also being able to go downstream and then maybe break out into a, into a floodplain and go laterally. And, and fill fill a, a floodplain up. Um, that's that's where we're starting to get into two two dimensional modeling. So, by and large, certainly within the core, when we're talking about hydraulic modeling to support consequence estimates, we're talking about two dimensional unsteady flow modeling. Okay. So now we'll talk about um, a little bit. If we're endeavoring in consequence estimation, what are our sources? What are our, what are our resources to, to, to start with? Um, I kind of have this laid out a little bit on level of detail up in the upper upper right there. You'll see from kind of the, your, your course level of detail at the higher level of detail. Um, so starting, the very first place to start is maybe trying to look at some existing flood maps. There are uh, methods out there for estimating consequences. I'm not sure how much they get touched on during, during this course, but there are method, empirical methods that, that take a look at, okay, what's the, the total area that, that's subject to flooding? What's the population at risk? And you can apply some, apply some factors and, and maybe take a look at what your consequence exposure is there. So just maybe a flood map is, is all you need for that level of detail. So we have, you know, the, the FEMA flood insurance rate maps are, are certainly a resource. Um, we have a national levy database that has a, 
uh, levied area described for each um, levy levy in the country. Um, and then we also have a lot of like dam projects will have emergency action plan maps where they've actually you know there was a big effort in the in the late 70s and 80s to to do to do to do mapping of dam failures. We've got some of those maps are still are still the best available. Um, so there's a lot of existing information out there. Um, so that's sort of like you know bare bones where you can start with. A lot of assumptions are associated with these. You know, with levees, we're usually talking about a, a, a bathtub type type of, of filling. Um, a lot of the EAP maps, historic EAP maps, use hydrologic routing of the flow and then use rating curves. Um, a lot of the FIS studies are, are based on that steady flow um, that, that I described earlier. So basic basic resources, but they also can be awfully valuable and, and, and can get you a lot of information quickly. Okay. So now in the core, <coughs> so our kind of our, our modern uh, approach to, to hydraulic modeling to support risk assessments, we do a base model. Um, <clears throat> so what this is, is, is we actually, you know, two-dimensional unsteady flow modeling with dam breaches or levee breaches, and we make some really some standardized set of assumptions. Um, we're using kind of the the best available you know tools, but we don't necessarily have all the information about you know uh, failure modes or specific specific breach locations of interest or, or or things like that. So we make some pretty standardized assumptions um, as far as inflow scenarios. We we use a use them. Um, you know, standard set of inflow assumptions, breach development is, is simplified, use simplified methods. And we um, provide some direct estimates of, of flood depths, arrival times, velocities. Um, yes, yeah, so, so we, we produce all that to support, to support our uh, life, sim, life sim modeling for consequences. So we do that for our base level. Now, now there are higher levels of studies, so we're able to to take those, take that same base model and 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 move it up, you know, sharpen the pencil, uh, move it up in level of detail, and 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 really improve it. You know, we can kind of get input from geotechnical engineers or structural engineers, and really kind of tailor tailor maybe the breach to a specific area of concern. Uh, maybe it's a gate failure, maybe it's a spillway failure, maybe it's a uh, Maybe on a dam, there's a specific area where we're piping as a concern along the abutment interface, or something like that, All right? So you'd actually model a really specific situation that that is of concern. And then inflows, you can maybe take a look at tailoring the inflow. Inflows, maybe there's some some uh, gator operations that would could be taken in the event of emergency that you could you could think through in a detailed fashion and think about. Well, maybe if if the if the main embankment start, starts breaching and, and releasing flow, maybe you can shut off the gates and sort of mitigate some of the, the downstream flooding uh, temporarily, things like that. So so we can take that same same level of detail uh, of model and and uh, refine it. Okay. So. That was kind of a preview to the way we way we work in the core, and I'm going to describe some of those some of those standard assumptions in, in, in more detail. Um, so in the core, we have uh, the Modeling, Mapping, and Consequence Center. <coughs> so it's a group of, of uh, you know, hydraulic engineers, consequence experts, and, and, and mapping, mapping team members that we, we kind of follow with uh, uh, kind of that criteria, uh, SOP, for model development for these, these, these base models. So the base modeling, we kind of do those. So we have a periodic assessment program for our for our core portfolio of, of dams, and <clears throat> for each of those, when they're up for a for a, you know kind of a periodic assessment, we we do base modeling using those methods: RAS, LifeSim, EAP, standard assumptions. Uh, we produce that, and then a periodic assessment team member of you know multidisciplined group you know you got engineers and economists and, and emergency managers operations staff 
uh, participate, uh, discuss some of the failure modes, and usually they can interpret the results from those base models and, and really be, get enough information to describe the consequence um, with, with some degree of, of, of certainty. And then if they need to do some minor model improvements, they, they, they can at that level. But then at that issue evaluation study, so the higher risk dams, we, we have a higher level of study in the core. Uh, dam safety mod studies, issue evaluation studies, sometimes we call them um, quantitative risk assessments. They take that base model and then they start applying some of those more detailed um, assumptions and, and uh, specific scenarios that I kind of alluded to earlier. So that's kind of the, the workflow that we use within the core. So start with the base model and build up. Okay, so loading conditions kind of for, for dams. You know, in, in 20 years ago or, or in the, really in, the, in, in that wave of, of dam failure um, modeling uh, projects that were done in the, in, in the 70s, 80s, they used the sunny day and, 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 uh, and uh, um, PMF was, 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 really, was really common. So we do, we do more resolution than that. Um, in, in lieu of sunny day, what we do is a normal high failure. So it's a 10% depth exceedance pool. So it's basically kind of on the high side. It's not average, an average pool elevation, which would be a 50% um, depth exceedance pool. We actually go uh, 10%. Um, that means that the, the pool is higher than that, that level 10% of the days um, in, in the year on average. So we do a 10% as kind of our, our sunny day. Then we go and take that a little bit further and stretch it out to that 1%, uh, a 1% uh, a pool. And then we look at a top of active storage pool. So that's, the, that's when we're holding back um, flooding, flood releases, but your dam is at the top of its, its max capacity. And then you get up to a maximum high. Uh, that's kind of a PMF event, the, the most rainfall we think that can that can fall in the basin and 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 uh, worst case scenario. And then separately, we have an intermediate high where we try to capture, you know, where the the the, the kind of a, a tipping point for consequences to where you're you're really um, ex, you know intermediate between that somewhere in between that top of active storage and max high. We try to there, there's some breakpoints and in, in consequences and releases there, so we, we we shoot for for doing an intermediate high. So five, five loading conditions for dams. For levees, it gets a little more complex. We, we have the extra parameter of breach location that, that's relevant. So we look at uh, a, a couple different breach locations, usually typically three, kind of you know, spatially distributed upstream to downstream. Try to focus those sometimes on consequence centers or areas of concern um, as far as levee performance and where you might have a a weakness in the in the in the levee, but then we also look at a range of loading loading uh, um, conditions from prior to overtopping three that are prior to overtopping, and then we look at a range of you know four overtopping scenarios. So all in all, we end up with a, a matrix of runs that ends up being about about 20, 20 runs on a typical levee. Okay, okay so uh, so breach estimate. Estimates. There's a lot of parameters that go into any any hydraulic model. I think one that's really unique and, and can be pretty critical to to uh, consequence estimates are are the is the breach. How big is it going to get? How fast is it going to develop? Um, when is it going to develop? I'll keep these terms kind of simple and understandable and stay away from the scientific words. How how big and how fast are, are is the breach? Is are we talking? You know, <laughs> how big of a breach? How fast will it develop? All right. Another piece of it is is the timing of when the breach occurs. This this is often a, a, a you know a discussion topic that needs a little bit of of nuance, um, especially when you're working with a with a multidiscipline team of engineers. Um, specifically, we all know that you can have pretty significant seepage either through a, a levee or, or or under a levee. That can that can be a serious concern and and maybe is the initiation of a of a breach, but it's really not letting 
uncontrolled release of the of the water come through. So in HEC RAS, we have a time zero of the breach that really we try to hone in on. We do hone in on when the when that uncontrolled release and kind of kind of really rapidly rising um, flow quantities coming through coming through the infrastructure. So that's T zero, which is not to be confused with with uh, the start of significant seepage, for instance. So it's it's important to to kind of think about that difference. Okay. Kind of here's a here's a plot of it. Um, I kind of I kind of talked to this already, but that breach initiation is not included in the in the hydraulic model, and that breach formation is really the piece that is. Um, then the then HEC RAS, of course, we capture that kind of formation of the breach and and continued development of the breach, widening of the breach, and then <coughs> that timing also. That also needs to relate and tie directly to the consequence estimate. So in, in life sim, or really any method, you're going to be interested in, interested in uh, warning. So you know, there isn't a hard and fast rule for how these are connected. T0 and the T0 kind of initiation of the, of the breach in RAS, I, I define that. And now, now you're talking about when would the warning go out relative to, to that. To that um, breach, breach initiation, or breach start of significant breaching that that, that we define in RAS. So, yeah, I think you'll see this this plot on the lower left um, several times this week um, in other, in other modules. But just be very aware that this can shift left and right, um, and and the connection between the RAS model and and that and that consequence model are are, are kind of critical and and need to be thought through and, and understood. Okay. Okay. So for dams, how do, how do we how do we estimate the breach the breach width and breach breach development time and, and other parameters? So generally for dams, what we what we do is is uh, use these studies that look at the regress uh, estimate of of breach width based on a bunch of historical breaches that have been studied and measured. So there's a you know a database of several hundred breaches um, out there, and they do things like they they look at well how big how big a volume was it was in the dam um, at the time it breached or how big is the dam how tall is the dam um, what was the what was the material um, those type of those type of uh, parameters and then. What was then, then separately the the result is how big was the breach, how fast did it form, if they if they measured it and washed it or or maybe can estimate it, <laughs> estimate what the result was, they can, you know, start to start to use those first set of parameters as a predictor for the second. So that's exactly what what we do. The most cited references that we use in the in the modeling mapping and consequences center are the there's a couple studies from from Froelich and then von Thun and Gillette. Um, are the most commonly used studies, so that is kind of kind of what we use for that baseline baseline estimate. So we we review the when we actually do the modeling, we review those regression regression equation results closely. Um, we look at the dam configuration. It's not just a matter of using the using the results from regression equation. We also have to look at whether you know the width you get from a regression equation even fits in the valley. Uh, it might be a good example of how we're kind of critically thinking about the results there. And then we've got uh, a set of agency, you know, within the core we have we have guidelines for, for kind of typical breach parameters, kind of constraints that we, that we want to stay within for earth and dams, you know, based on the on the height of the dam. We know that we know there's some maximum envelope. Um, so there's been some there's been some uh, um, policies written down in the core to, to kind of give some guidelines aside from just using regression results directly. Okay, so that's our approach <laughs> um, for earthen dams. Now, concrete dams are a little bit of a different can be a little bit of a different animal. Um, uh, it's not 
you know, it depends on how the how the how the dam was was created. You know, an arch dam, concrete arch dam. If they fail, we kind of it's all one big piece, and we'd kind of expect that entire arch to, to to fall, and the whole thing to, to to come out completely, and you'd have the valley width to to uh, for a breach. Whereas a uh, you know concrete gravity dams that were built in in sections with with joints, um, they have separate monoliths. So if one monolith maybe slides or 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 um, or, or tilts, you'd have a different different uh, breach than if than if the whole thing did. So um, usually we're looking at a certain, you know, with the concrete gravity dam, we're talking about how many monoliths would slip. Um, and so we have some mostly guidelines there. Um, it's hard. It, it's hard to really have. You need you need to have a conversation with structural engineers that are thinking through the failure modes themselves to really do a better job of estimating. Um, gravity dam, gravity dam failures. Um, I guess one of the one of the highlights on for for concrete dams is that we're we're typically looking at quickly quickly developing breaches that kind of almost fail instantaneously um, versus uh, earthen embankment that you know develops over over a length of time. So within with some of the some of the inputs into the HEC RAS model itself, um, how do we how do we apply these these uh, if, how do we apply these parameters once we have them? Um, kind of as a standard in the core uh, horizontal location, we usually center center the location of the breach over the highest portion of the dam. Um, we usually initiate the the breach at the bottom of the breach. So if it's a piping, it actually we give it that full head and 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 initiate it at the at the bottom of the breach. And then um, we also erode it all the way down to the valley, essentially the the valley floor, the natural river floor, um, as far as where we go with the with the depth of the breach. And then on timing, um, you know, we usually initiate. I'm saying usually a lot. This is this is what our standard says. Um, we initiate the 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 breach when the dam hits the peak pool um, for the for the scenario being modeled. And then there's this question of once it initiates, does it just you know you have a you have a certain amount of of development time, say an hour, but do you does does it erode kind of evenly across that hour or does it or does it start out slow and then pick up the pace and then and then uh, and then slow down? So that's what that sine wave does. We actually use a sine wave progression. So it does kind of we have it um, develop a little slower at the beginning, pick up the pace, and then when it starts to get the full breach width, it slows down a bit. Which is it's kind of connected to the amount of head we'd expect to have in the pool itself, right? Once the when the pool starts dropping, you're going to have less driving head, and and you're going to slow that you wouldn't expect the the breach to be developing as fast. So we use a sine wave. <clears throat> okay, and then so for for higher level studies, you know, we get together with a uh, with with the multidiscipline team. You review case histories. You talk through very specific potential failure modes. Maybe you have some some uh, modeling that you can bring in from specific dam breach models. So because they look at the erodibility and 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 water actually flowing through or over the embankment. And you can you can actually there are models that that, that do that. Wind Dam is one of them. DL Breach um, is actually DL Breach. Some of the DL Breach um, algorithms are embedded in RAS as of really just a couple years ago. So you can do <coughs> more detailed, physically based modeling of the of the breaches. Um, so. You, take, you kind of put that all in the hopper, and with discussion, you decide maybe are there some specific scenarios you want to model, and then you can update that base model uh, to improve your estimate of your of your uh, breach scenario. <clears throat> okay, so for levy levies are a little bit of a different animal. Um, those <clears throat> databases of dam failures that I talked about, the the Frolic. The the Von Thun and Gillette really don't apply. I mean, I think that the it should be kind of somewhat obvious why not. Those predictor inputs, you know, volume of dam, volume of water in the dam, 
for instance, we don't have that for levies. So for levies, we have to come up with some other other way to do to do to do a um, an estimate of, of what the breach width might be. So <clears throat> there's really no yeah, like I said, there's no widely accepted regression equations. Um, so we need we need to find a separate method. So what we what we use is. Uh, it's embedded in the HEC RAS. There's a simplified physical breach method, and it, you know, uses the velocity of water flowing through the breach, and ties that to the the uh, widening rate of the of the breach itself. So once, so what you'll see there is once you have kind of head equalized across the the levee, uh, when the when the bathtub fills up, for instance, you know, erosion will shut off. But at the very beginning of the breach, where you have a lot of head, you're gonna you're gonna be eroding faster. So we have some um, information to rely on: erosion rate versus velocity relationships, actually measured in a lab, um, that we can use as sort of a, a, a you know foundation for this. And then through through um, model studies and and, and experience, we we've, we're starting to get close to to. Um, you know, understanding maybe what that velocity versus erosion relationship should be, and we have some some guidelines, some standards for for what to use. Um, so these are these are helpful plots. Like on the on the right here, you can look at <laughs> breach velocity over time and overlay that with breach width over that same time period, and then also look at that head differential um, over that same time period, and you can see it it acts as behave when you got higher head higher head. Um, Differential, you also have higher velocities, and the breach width is forming faster. It sort of stabilizes, and then when you get to a certain, um, you know, maximum head differential, your your breach width um, levels off, and you really don't have any additional any additional um, oh, widening. Okay. So last section here, just kind of. Talking about applying these model results and, and considering the uncertainty and, and, and how we apply them. I just reality check, yeah, all, all models you know produce uncertain results. I shouldn't it says this this slide says all hydraulic models. Really all models have, have some uncertainty in them. Uh, breach models in particular have you have to make a, a major assumption for, for breach size and the timing of that breach. And there's, of course there's a lot of other assumptions that go into it. So I think we'd all be fooling ourselves if we thought that any specific model scenario that we ran is is, is you know the the truth and and is and is uh, going to happen. It's it's a useful model, but it isn't necessarily you know an exact predictor of the future. Wanted to make one point on to kind of make make us all feel a little bit more at ease with with some of those assumptions. Um, one thing that we have going for us is that is that uh, for dams, there is attenuation that happens in the floodplain, especially when you have a major event like a like a, a dam failure. You'll ha you, you'll see a very big difference of what the flood depths and flows are right by the, right next to the dam, immediately downstream. <coughs> but because that shock is so big, it does also typically gets absorbed in a flood in, in the floodplain. So you'll see that as you're moving downstream, um, you'll actually see a pretty uh, much smaller difference and, and much less sensitivity to that big uncertain assumption we make with, with breach parameters. So if you know th these results here have been around for this is from you know HEC RAS manual uh, type material from from decades ago, but uh, it shows that. You know, for for this example, study dam. You know, ten ten miles downstream, you had a, a relatively minor increase in 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 peak flow. So, if you have a consequence center that's say located twenty miles downstream of the dam, it's going to be a lot less sensitive to the input breach parameter than it would be if your if your consequence center, your community was immediately downstream of the dam. So, just we we have that sort of as a as a you know something to think about. When we're when we're, it, it doesn't. Not everything depends on some of these inputs, right? All right. I already made this point. Near 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 dam consequences are the most sensitive to to the breach assumptions, and and downstream is less sensitive. Um, and then also a really important 
thing that we can do, a useful thing that we can do in, in the modeling world here, is we can do sensitivity analysis on, on, on some of the you know, assumptions like the, the, the breach width and development time and see how important they are. So we might not know which one is, is, is the truth, but if we, if we model two scenarios, we can see maybe that consequence center that I mentioned 20 miles downstream, you, we might be able to see that we're really talking about maybe a tenth of a foot of, of peak elevation difference. Um, so we can do a sensitivity analysis to really see if, you know, how sensitive our, our inputs are. Yeah, so sort of just sort of driving that home. So yeah, all models are, are wrong, but some are useful. It's a kind of a famous quote that, that, that we hear, uh, George Box, and kind of similar theme, models are to be used, not believed. Um, so you really need to use model results and apply them with, you know, through a critical thinking lens. Um, methods used by Dameron Levy Safety allow for consistent risk ranking across the portfolio. Um, so it's consistency. Um, we can make some good decisions, risk-informed decisions uh, within that context. So you're really gaining some important insights through the analysis of results, um, you know, not treating any individual result as, as the truth. Uh, relative com comparisons can be, can be made um, and also impact on modeling assumptions. We can evaluate those things with the, with the sensitivity, um, sensitivities that I just discussed earlier. And then, like I said, not every uh, assumption drives overall impact. So um, that is, is all, all I had.